in all of Scripture, as far as I can tell, Jesus only ever gives us one prayer request. One time where he says, pray for this. And I've read the Bible cover to cover. That's the only thing I can find. I could be wrong. But Jesus gives us one single prayer request in all of Scripture. In fact, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to open it to Matthew chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, uh, I'll read the Scripture to you in the translation that most of you use. If you've got it on your device, whatever. Matthew chapter 9, hurry up, take your time. I'll set it up while you're going there. Jesus had been traveling around. He'd been doing great ministry. Crowds were following him. And uh, there's a moment where he stops. And Matthew records this. He said, Jesus stopped and he looked at the crowds and his heart had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew chapter 9, you there? Okay. And then he says this. Simply, in verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, there's a prayer request, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Heard that before? Just raise your hand real quick. Yeah, some of you read that. You've been around the Christian ghetto for a minute. So here's the deal. The only time I can tell Jesus says to pray for something. He doesn't pray for healing. He doesn't say, hey, you know what? Pray for more money. He doesn't say, oh, pray for your future. Pray for who you're supposed to get married to. Now, it's not bad to pray for those things. But he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. What he's talking about is he's looking at a field that's ripe. And he's saying, here's the problem. The harvest is plentiful, it's ripe, it's ready to go, it's ready to be harvested. Translation, there are lost people everywhere. If we bring it right here and now in the, you know, backwoods of Butt, Kansas, whatever, the harvest is plentiful at Fort Hayes State. Do you know any lost people? On your team, in your dorm, go to coffee with them, in your class, wherever? He's saying we got all these people ripe to get picked for What? for a relationship with God, with this Jesus. And he says, the harvest is plentiful. Here's the problem. The workers are few. Pray for more workers. Now, I'm also going to tell you this. Correct me if I'm wrong. It is the only prayer request that you can answer. Trick move, Jesus. Pray to me for more workers. And oh, you know, parentheses, by the way, you're the answer to that prayer request. So I'm going to talk fast. I believe this describes what I'm going to share with you tonight is how people come to Christ. This is how you came to Christ if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian here tonight, this is how you're on the way to coming to Christ. Is the workers, that word workers, it's interesting to me. He doesn't say more leaders, more people with microphones, more old guys that have read the Bible cover to cover, more amazing worship leaders like we just had tonight, more people with great Bible degrees. and the, you know, We don't need more leaders in the church, not bigger staff and all that. Jesus is saying, I need one thing. I just need workers. I call them dominoes. Dominoes. I'm going to prove this theory to you here tonight simple. I stole it. Think about how you came to Christ. Now, I'm not talking about dominoes, the game. Nobody plays that. That's like an ancient game. I'm talking about dominoes, what dominoes are meant, and that's for little kids to stack them up. I only brought three. Give me a break. But, like, imagine that long chain of dominoes. You've seen it on YouTube, right? It's always some guy in Iceland who's got way too much time on his hands, and he's got dominoes, you know, climbing the walls and setting off nuclear missiles. You knock them down. That's what dominoes do. You tracking with me now? Come on, you with me? I mean, what's the matter? Did you go to public school? Are you with me? Okay. So look, think about how you became a Christian. Think about who brought you here. Think about who first told you about Jesus. The first person to explain it to you. Think about who told them. Think about the domino chain of people, significant people, insignificant people. You see, it's not always the preacher. We give preachers way too much credit, and I am one. 
We give them way too much credit. Oh, if I just had your words. Oh, if I just knew what you knew. Oh, if I could just present the gospel. Then I, oh, just all my friends, these people that I care about, boy, I could do that. And that's not how it works. In God's economy, there's only one person who gets glory when anyone calls on the name of Jesus. And you know who that is? God. He uses men and women in this cosmic, like almost, it's in the unseen realm. We know some of them. We don't know some of them. They're ordinary men and women with very little qualifications that show up in the harvest field as workers. You see, there's a lot of sermons I could give you on Matthew chapter 9. One of the things is this. If you don't get a harvest out the harvest field in time, it'll rot. It'll rot. It's going to be worthless. And so when it's harvest time, you need workers. And they don't have to be skilled. They just have to suit up, shut up, and show up. And when I say shut up, you know, we make all these excuses why we don't want to participate in the domino chain. Number one is I'm qualified. Well, I got a verse for you. I'm not going to look it up, but you can write it down. In Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says about the very first disciples, a guy named Peter and John, that these guys, after Jesus left and he gave them this great commission, go and make disciples. Remember, these are guys didn't go to college, probably didn't finish high school. They're blue collar bros. They fish for a living and they're not on the outdoor channel, right? They're commercial guys. They're not even on Biggest Catch. And these bros have spent three years with Jesus. And now Jesus is left and he says, it's up to you, go do it. And he's like, okay, let's do it. And they get in trouble because they're preaching in the city that had Jesus put to death. And in that city, they begin to preach the sermon of their lives. When they're done, these, these leaders that had Jesus put to death, this is what they say about these disciples. It says, when they realized, Acts 4.13, that they were ordinary and unschooled, they were amazed. Some translation says they were amazed because they were ignorant and illiterate. You go to college, I think you know how to read, or at least find a book on tape or the cliff notes, right? But these guys, ordinary, unschooled, illiterate, ignorant. It says, but then they took note, these men had been with Jesus. Ah, I get it. Tonight, my goal is to convince you to commit yourself to being one of these. An ordinary, schooled or unschooled, ignorant or not, illiterate or not, doesn't matter, known or not known, paid or unpaid, domino in somebody's domino chain. You see, this is how it happens. Somebody... Uh, uh, who's very, very far from God. Somebody invites them to something like encounter. Some of them, you know, back in high school, you might invite them to a youth event or if you're an FCA, they tr invited you to an FCA event. You're like, okay, there's gonna be, you know, chicks there, cool, I'm in, you know. And then they're showing up for all the wrong reasons and their snacks and whatever. And all of a sudden they hear worship like that. The spirit of God is in the place and they're like, what do these people have that I don't have? I'm just making up this story as I go along, right? Somebody invites them. Maybe I'll go back, maybe not. Maybe years later they go back. You know, I went to this encounter thing. It was kind of weird in college. I don't know what it was about, you know, a bunch of people with hands in the air and whatever. But now life happened, and they got their kids and, 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 and a wife that doesn't love them, and they're trying to figure it out, and they go to someone else, and someone who's work is, why don't you come to my church? Come to find out there's another domino we didn't even see in the chain is somebody's grandma's been praying for them, Right? Someone else said a word. Mel Gibson made a movie called The Passion of the Christ. They got bored and clicked on it on Amazon around Easter time. It's like all of these dominoes that God ordains in a line, and then all of a sudden things get serious. And I've only brought three, but there's like a, be a thousand. And then somebody at the end, you know, presents the gospel, and everybody goes, oh, gospel man, you're a hero. And I say, no, because what about praying grandma? What about Mel Gibson? What about dude that invited him to encounter? What about K-Love that they accidentally got on Sirius Radio? I don't know. You guys tracking? You guys tracking? I don't spend a lot of time on that. I don't have all That's how it happens. That's how you got here. Even if you're sitting here going, oh, I was born and raised in a Christian home. Oh, yeah? Who led your parents to Christ? Well, their parents. Well, who led them to Christ? You follow that domino chain back 2,000 years, and it goes to the first dominoes. It goes all the way back to Jesus. The problem is we don't believe in that. We don't believe in the power of one. 
We want big. We want better. We want an album. We want a speaking tour. We want the magic book. And I say, no, it's ordinary, unschooled people who are qualified. How are they qualified according to Acts chapter 4, verse 13? Have you been with Jesus? Trick question. How many of you have been with Jesus? Raise your hand. Bro, are there no Christians here? Okay, where two or three or more gathered in my name, I'm right there with them. God inhabits the praises of his people, right? When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you. How many of you frickin' been with Jesus? Thank you. No, 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 put your hands up. Hands up, put your hands up, right? Okay, you've been with Jesus. Guess what? You're qualified by your own witness to be one of these, according to Scripture. You say, well, how does that happen? It's way beyond my pay grade. Here's another verse for those of you that are, you know, homeschoolers that are putting your diary here. Here's all the notes. Ready? I love homeschoolers. Stop. up. Okay, I got the mic. You don't. Here we go. John chapter 6, verse 44. John chapter 6, verse 44. Love it. Jesus talking again. He says something really spooky that, you know, divides denominations. But he said it. I believe it. No wasted words. This is what he says. No one can come to me unless my Father in heaven draws him first. No one can come to me unless my Father in heaven draws him first. I don't quite understand it. I don't care if you're free will or predestination, whatever. Okay, here's the deal. That means in the unseen realm, God is drawing people to himself. And he's drawing people to himself all the time. I believe he's drawing somebody tonight. He's drawing people closer to him. He draws us through circumstances. He draws us through good things. He draws us through bad things. He draws us through individuals. He, he draws us through that nagging forever empty that's inside every human being that makes us search for meaning, that makes us medicate to try to fill the forever empty. In our, he's always drawing people, and here's the deal. He drew you, and he's drawing people around you. In your dorm, on your team, at the coffee shop, at the library, the kid no one talks to, the kid everyone talks to. You don't know who God is drawing. But you're qualified to be a part of his process. God loves to work with his people. We want a God that's a genie in a lamp. Oh, just save that person. He doesn't do it that way. He uses ordinary men and women as dominoes to show up in significant ways and insignificant ways. Let me give you a couple examples. Some of us, like me, are really good at talking. And leaders give me a hard time about that because my mouth's been going all day. Well, he's using my mouth to draw people. But some of us are really good at serving. Some of us are really good at singing. Some of us are really good at behind the scenes stuff. Some of us have creative personality. Some of us are really great at Call of Duty. That's my skill. I'm gonna be pro Call of Duty. Well, good job, bro. When you move out of your parents' basement, you can use that. God can use all of our giftings. God can use our passions, the things we're good at. My wife has the spiritual gift of shopping. She can use that for the glory of God. Are you guys tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? And he uses what we have and who we are. Many people say to me, well, I'm not qualified because I don't know a bunch of verses. I've only been a Christian for a minute. If you've been a Christian for a minute, Christ lives in you. Now you're qualified because you can tell somebody what Christ has done for you. You can invite them to a place. You can serve them. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Can you love people lavishly? Can you love them with your resources? Can you love them with your time? Can you be the one person when everything hits the fan in someone's life and everyone's like, oh, I'm really sorry, and da-da-da, and there's a big cry fest usually in a sorority or whatever, you know, and they have a big tear. And, some, and sometimes with the bros too, I don't care, I don't know, right? That cancer. Do you know God can use cancer as a domino? He's drawing people. He can use a good thing. Oh, I got this amazing opportunity. But many times when something bad ha happens, you see a Christian that goes up to someone and says, hey, you know, when everyone else is gone and you go, hey, I heard about that thing, you know, with your girl and I know you're really hurting right now. Do you mind if I pray for you about that? It's a little tactic. You know, I've done that, I don't know how many hundreds of times, no one has ever told me no. No one's ever told me no. In fact, I'm going to tell you a domino story right now. I'm going to tell you about uh, the girl that cuts my hair. I thought my hair was fine, but my, my wife was like, no, stop going to the barber thing. You're going to some chick with blue hair in the mall, some of these salon things. Pay way too much money for this. And I'm sitting there. This, we're not, I don't know if we're recording, but her name's Chicory. 
right, chicory. And she's like Wiccan Buddhist. She's like all into the natural, you know, circle of life, the whole deal. And she's got purple hair. And, you know, she just started cutting my hair. My wife's like, that's the girl you're going to every single time because she cuts it right and I'm the boss. So I'm like, yeah, I'm down. So I keep going to chicory all the time. So I get to know Chicory. I don't tell her what I do. I'm just like, uh, uh, you know, just she was into cool music and we talk about movies and great conversation, right? We're just having a conversation the whole time. This chick, Chicory, she starts opening up to me about her life. After like six, eight months, at least three times, she was in tears while she's cutting my hair. I'm sorry. I just, I just, and it's stuff with her boyfriend and she's living with and I think he's hitting her and all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, one day I'm coming in and she's in a great mood. She's telling everybody, oh, check it out. This is my favorite client, him and his wife, the good tippers. By the way, tipping is a domino. Yes. And she's like, hey, uh, it's a big domino. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to drop bombs. And, and, and she just says, uh, she, goes, she goes, what is it that you do again right there in front of everyone in the salon? He's like some kind of public speaker. Is that what you do? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, no, really, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a, I'm a preacher. She goes, me, you know, sorry, profanity, fill in the blank, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. She goes, you're kidding me. You're a preacher? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so she stayed my friend. She still did a good job. A year later, she called me at my work in tears because he's going to jail. Life's falling apart. And she's like, um, I just know what to do, and just da 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 da, you know. But you know, you've always been really nice to me, and everything. And I can just tell she's fishing. I finally said, Chickory, do you want me to pray for you? She said, Would you? I said, Yeah. And I never do this. Like I'm always the guy back to this guy who's like, Hey, can I pray for you? And you're like, Yeah. You know, they always say, Yeah. I never drop to one knee right there in the hall of the dorm and get out the anointing oil and like, Let's do this. <laughs> don't be that guy, okay? Just don't. It's weird. I walk away, usually. I walk away. I'm like, cool, I'm going to pray for you. And then because that's, that's awesome, then I, I go pray for that person. Next time I see that person, I go, hey, uh, you know that thing, how's that thing going with the, you know, your girl and all that kind of stuff? And, and it doesn't matter what they say because if they go, oh, man, it's just terrible, I go, I'm going to keep praying. What, did I, what do you tell someone when you say, I'm going to pray for you as a domino? You say, I love you, I care about you, I care enough to pray for you, and I believe that there's a God who loves you and cares about you, and he's going to listen. And then if they go, oh, it's great, they go, oh, yeah, you know, it's really, really going good this last week. I go, I know, I've been praying. <laughs> With Chicory on the phone, I took a risk. I said, do you want me to pray for you right now? Through tears, she said, would you? I pray with her in Jesus' name, an atheist, on the phone. Next time I saw her, things were going great. And I was like, hey, how's that thing? Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's what worked it out. And, oh, but by the way, thanks, you know, that whole prayer thing. We just needed all the positive energy we could get in that moment. <laughs> I don't care what you call it. You see, if God is drawing people to himself, that means he gets the glory. I don't know when or how. All I know is I'm supposed to be a domino. See, the beautiful thing, if I could stack up a thousand dominoes and you would commit to just being one in someone's life in the positive direction instead of the negative direction, who gets the glory when that person finally meets Jesus? Not you. Not praying grandma. Not the guy or girl that led them to Christ and had them pray the prayer and take the knee and all that stuff. Not the one who baptized. God gets the glory. You see the beauty of that? Now the pressure's off because that's the biggest reason people give for not doing anything in the harvest field as a worker is because they think that they have to be the whole smash. No, you just have to be one because watch this. If this is where the person is, right? Here's the number three, and this is where Jesus is, and you're in the middle, if you don't show up, How do they get there? They don't. Jesus had one request, that we be a domino, that we be a worker. And only you can be the answer to that prayer request. And you can do it in big ways. You can do it in small ways. You can do it with tipping. I mentioned tipping, right? My pet peeve is when people go into a restaurant and they're like, oh, let's pray. And then just like, you know what? I don't think this lady wants a very nice tip because, you know, my food arrived cold and late and da-da-da-da-da. 
Stop. I have a policy. If the service is bad, the tip is triple. She's having a bad day. She's mean to me, she's getting more. Don't you try that, whoever's amen in me, who's ever a waitress down here. <laughs> That's a lie to a preacher. That's double jeopardy. But I see Christians, we don't live it. We live it, we, you could live it with the girl to drive through. You could live it with the guy that checks out the balls at the gym. You could do it with the, your RA. You could do it with random people, strangers, people on a plane. The person that's the most annoying person in your living situation, your apartment or wherever you're at. Instead of choosing to see them as a nuisance, what if you were to choose to see them as a potential child of God that he might be drawing and you might be the one that you could just build a relationship with. Hey, you want to get a coffee? Hey, you want to play Call of Duty in my, my parents' basement? Hey, do you want to go hunting? I saw God use hunting in a powerful way. I, I live in redneck country up in northern Michigan. Little uh, uh, blanket. Do we have any rednecks in the house? Okay, if we talk about shooting deer, you're going to get sad? Okay, too bad. You're from Kansas. <laughs> so, uh, so my church, uh, we were holding our staff meeting in the bar. It's a long story, okay? But it was because church people interrupted staff meeting because it was a small church that was exploding into a bigger church, a church this size, and, and, uh, uh, and it has no business being in a town of 600 with a blinking light. And so we heard that Christians never go into the bar, and we figured that's where Jesus might hang out. So we said, let's take staff meeting on Tuesdays into the bar. Two amazing things happened. One, we tipped the heck out of the waitress there, and it was so, I mean, in fact, my associate pastor, Tim, was like, we're going to bless her. Betsy was our waitress every Tuesday. He's always blessing her. And he was, you know, because we could get like a 75 cent cheeseburgers. I could buy lunch for the whole staff, you know, even on a preacher's salary. And then they would just throw in tips. So it would be like a $25 uh, tab. And she was getting like a 40 or $50 tip every week. Pretty good, huh? And she knows we're Christians. Everyone knows her from the church. This goes on six, seven, eight, nine months. And then the owner of the bar comes up to me one day and says, hey, uh, preacher, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah. And by the way, don't use this as a license to start bar ministry, okay? Be cool, stay in school, all right? <laughs> but uh, so like we, I was like, yeah, Frank, what's up? And he goes, hey, I just wanted to say, uh, um, a little lip starts shaking, starts getting the tears. He's like, I want to say thanks for coming into my bar. I wanted to say uh, no one from your church has ever come in here before. And uh, that just means a lot. And then he asked me if I'd do his wedding. Dominoes. Through tips at a bar. A couple months later, a guy named Bob walks up to me in our staff meeting in the bar. Now the church people are gone, but now pagans are like interrupting. And he's like, <laughs> you, know, and it, you know, in my town, I used to like to joke a lot about how how I never shot a deer. Because I was born, I was raised in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. We didn't shoot deer. Now I'm trying to be like the rednecks. I want to be with these people. And I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like Elmer Fudd in the woods. Where's the deer? You know, I don't know. <laughs> and, and so I used to joke, you guys are all, you know, hunters. I haven't shot nothing. And his wife went to our church. He didn't go to our church. He heard about the joke. He had pity on me. The guys in my church didn't. God was drawing him. God was drawing Bob to himself. And Bob shows up one day at the, at the bar, and, and he knew that's where we had staff meeting, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and he says, hey, do you still have your uh, deer tag? I mean, have you should not shot a deer yet? And I go, nope. And I gave him some lame excuse, and he was like, you come to my deer camp tonight, we'll get you deer. And he walked away. Bob's 25 years older than me, served in Vietnam, shot everything in North America. <laughs> I, no, he's legit. He is the Buckley man. He is more man than all of you. And uh, Bob just, uh, you know, I called my wife. We had plans. Hey, honey, I got to go here. And she was like, who asked you to go hunting? Bob? Because she's from Buckley, Michigan. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you have to go. You have to go. He, you just got invited to the innermost layer of the onion of Buckley. <laughs> so I was okay, I'm going hunting. I show up at the deer camp. There's all these other hunters at the deer camp. And all of them were ticked that the preacher was there because none of them went, you know, none of them were Christians. But Bob is the boss of everything. And he's like, Okay, you know, Sammy, you're going to go down to the swamp. That guy's going to go down on the back 40, and, and you're going to go sit in the cornfield. And he's like, preacher and I, we're going to the tower. And I'm like, this is where I die. <laughs> and it's me and Bob up this, like, three-story tower in the middle of, there was swamp, there was bottomland. I won't bore you with all that stuff. And he lights up a big cigar, and we just started talking. And we didn't see anything. 
on Monday night. On Tuesday, we saw a doe, and I took a shot at, or sorry, we saw a buck on Tuesday night, and I took a shot at it and missed. It was muzzle loading season. Get off me. I never shot a muzzle loader, you know, and, and Bob was cool, and we just had great conversation. I heard about his life, and I heard about Vietnam. I actually heard that back in the day, he went to my church, but then he got drafted, and then he did things and saw things in Vietnam that made him lose his faith and make him bitter and resentful. He told me, John, I spent 40 years running, and I'm so glad that our, you know, this town's got a church, and it's got a preacher that hunts, and I'm over here going, I missed <laughs> You know, he's like, oh, that doesn't matter. I'll teach you. Don't worry. And, he, and, and I just want to learn about hunting. On, on Wednesday night, we didn't see anything. And Bob's feeling bad. I'm starting to feel like Jonah. The deer aren't coming because I'm here. <laughs> he, he, he just kept inviting me back because we were making friends. On Thursday night, you know, I missed again. On Friday, last day of the hunt, I bought him two, like, very expensive cigars. And I sat up in that deer stand. Hey, Bob, I brought you something. He's like, oh, Johnny. And then I got up to courage because, hey, you don't have to be a preacher to be freaked out because one-on-one's freaky. I'm just sitting there with Bob, and, dude, I realized I made a friend. He's like the grandpa that I, that, to teach you hunting that I didn't have. I, didn't have. I was separate. I was living overseas. I didn't have all that experience. And now it's like Grizzly Adams to teach me everything and tell me stories. And all he wants to talk about is church. And all I want to do is talk about hunting. And finally, I got up the courage because I realized God's doing something. Through his wife, through way back when he was a kid in 40, there's a reason he came to hang out with me. He sought me out. So I had to take a risk, and I was scared to death. Finally, I just said, uh, hey, uh, uh, Bob, uh, you know, this has been a great week, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get one of some from back from there. He's like, yep, he's just over there. And then finally I said, all I do is want to know about hunting, and all you want to do is talk about church. My exact words were, what do I have to do to get hell to freeze over for, to get a guy like you to actually come to my church? And we're in a stare down just like this. <laughs> like John Wayne, he brings up that cigar. <laughs> and I'm like, this, this is where I pushed it too far. This is where I die. <laughs> and then Bob looks past me out the window, and he goes, dear and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I got my first deer. And it was exciting and gutted the deer. He did all that and like, gross, but trying to be cool. And, you know, and he's like, well, you know, I'm going to bring you the meat and da-da-da. I'll bring it over to your house. I'll get it processed. This was awesome. We made friends and that was all. And I was like, oh, whew. I invited. Okay, now it's up to the Lord. He shows up at my house a month later with all the meat. And he's standing in my lobby. This man. Sorry, he's my friend. And he said to me, he goes, hey, are you preaching this weekend over at that church? I said, yes, sir. And he said, maybe we'll start the year off right. My man Bob has been in church ever since. And I just got to be the last domino. And I was scared to death. I was scared to death. There are domino stories around you. If there's a God that draws people to himself and he uses workers to do it, that means every moment of your life is pregnant with eternal possibilities. And you don't know which domino you're gonna be. And it doesn't matter. You might be the first one. Good for you. You might be the middle one. Great. You might be the closer. Great. You might be one of the millions in between. Like, it, like one of those number lines. It just goes on to infinity. You can be a negative domino. You can turn people off about Jesus. You can turn them off about encounter. You can turn them off about Christians. Or you can say, you know what? As for me, I'm going to do whatever I can. And the results aren't up to me because no one can come to me unless my father draws him first. The point is, I don't know who he's drawn. That's above my pay grade. That's not my job. But I know what is my job is to be an answer to Jesus' prayer request and to suit up, shut up with my excuses, and show up. And I can do that. I don't need a job. I don't need a job description. You don't need training. You can do it tonight. I got time for about one more story. It's my favorite story. And again, it's about Buckley. And when we first moved there, we didn't have awesome worship. Nathan, you're gifted, bro. Praise God. Thanks, Thanks for being a domino a theologian who's also a worship leader. I mean, that's amazing. 
and all the rest of them too. Well, we didn't have this. I mean, we had, I was the youth pastor first, and so we had like uh, really horrible worship music, right? We were, sorry, is that possible? Yes. Uh, we were playing <laughs> CDs. We had girls that couldn't sing that were singing with the CDs. You know, we had the, you know, the, it was just bad, you know? And so I started talking to two of my youth guys. I'm like, is anybody in this town that I've just moved to in the middle of the Arctic Circle? I'm like, can anyone play guitar? No one can play guitar. Really? It's America. Come on. And, and they're like, well, there's one guy who can play guitar. His name's Salty. Salty? Well, yeah. Well, what grade is he in? Well, he's in 13th grade. <laughs> he's on the victory lap. Uh, you know. And I was like, where's Salty? Well, you know, he graduated, but he lives in his parents' basement. He's awesome, man. He can do covers of Def Leppard, Megadeth, you know, Bon Jovi. You name it. He's amazing. He plays a lot of weddings with his dad. Invite him to come to the student ministry. Nope. Why? He'll never come. Bro! And I've been started to preach dumb. I was like, come on. Just go invite him. Next week, we invited him. He doesn't want to come. All right, we'll start hanging out with him. What's he like? He likes tacos. Go for a run for the border. So th these bros reignited a friendship with Salty. They started taking him for tacos. True story. In fact, I saw Salty. Well, I won't get there. All right. So they started going for runs for the border, you know, and they, they just started hanging out with him again and going to his house and talking to him about how amazing youth group is. And we have a new youth center and a great sound system and how the worship sucks. You know, we need you, bro. And, and this went on for months. And then, and then, you know, they invited me to a shooting thing. I don't know how to shoot skeet, but Salty's there. They were like, Ooh, introduce him to you. And so I was just trying to be cool and my turn. And I'm like, what? Well, pull. I hit it. It was like, and then I'm like, Lord, help me hit another one. Pull, nicked it, that counts. <laughs> I was three for three. I had five rounds, but I was like, give me something hard to do, bros. Next. Because when you're three for three as a preacher, walk away. <laughs> walk away. Well, uh, so that's the first time I met him, but I mean, that, that wasn't the magic moment. That just made it okay. That just proved him, okay, that guy's pretty cool. He could hit the skeet or whatever. And then we finally did get some worship leaders, some good adults that were coming in and playing. By that time, I'm the lead pastor. This, this went on for years. Dudes being intentional dominoes in Salty's life. His name is Mike. <laughs> and then I got the worship band. I'm like, bro, you know what? We need more help. I know you can play a few chords, three chords in the truth, every Chris Tomlin song. But come on, <laughs> come on. Can, let, let's just get Salty in here. So they invited Salty, and Salty never wanted to come. And then finally, one night, it was actually after youth group, I was doing double duty, Salty shows up. I go, what's he doing here? Well, he, you know, we invited him to play some music for us. And I wanted to go home. It was late. I had kids. Nope. All the kids left. It was just us and the worship team, and he just plugged in and started. I mean, it was like school of rock. It was awesome, you know. <laughs> Made friends. They started inviting Salty to come to practice. Hey, because it was like they would practice worship, and then after worship, musicians love to play. Here's a guy that never got to play. Very creative. God had gifted him, and he didn't have an audience. He was doing weddings occasionally, but he never got to play. So he would come, and then they would jam to like midnight after worship practice. Well, he started coming earlier and earlier. And this is just with the worship band, right? Then they were like, hey, Salty, can you get up here and show us these chords? So all of a sudden, he's showing them how to shred the chords. And this is going on, and I didd even know. One of the guys in the band hired him, gave him a job, and they're running around putting in electrical and security systems, you know. Then one Sunday morning, true story, church is about to start. Our worship leader comes running up to me, and he goes, John, Nathan, you'll love this. John, we got a situation. we got a situation. I go, what's up, bro? I'm thinking, oh, no. The, even the bad musicians aren't here. And he goes, Salty's here. I go, really? I go, is he going to play? And he goes, he's plugging in. And I go, awesome. And I'm thinking, because you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to shred, you know? And he goes, John, he's wearing a hat. True story. The guy talking to me had a beanie on. I'm like, you're wearing a hat. <laughs> we don't care about hats. We're not hat police church. I mean, we were kind of making church groovy and cool. We threw out the organ and the piano. We were getting rock and roll, and you know, the hipsters showed up. Pants are too tight. But they had the, you know, whatever. And uh, he's like, John, look at his hat. And I looked over. True story. He had long hair then and a beard. He looked like uh, the Edge from the Joshua Tree Tour. And he's got a trucker hat. And uh, uh, it's white in the front, red in the back, and in huge red letters, right? It says, I love bikinis. 
No, you don't get this. He's going to pr- play in both of the services. The, the old people early service first. And then the cooler, younger crowd second. And he goes, what do we do? And I'm thinking, ah, he's come down. He doesn't know any better. Let it ride. And on Monday morning, my phone started ringing. And that's part of a lead pastor job. Yep, yep, yep. No, no, no. I love the national anthem. Yep, yeah, yeah, I know I'm with you. Yep, yep, I'm down. I don't know why their pants are on the ground. I don't know. They just, no, no, hats in church. No, you know, we're not the happily. So, all right, and it was like, right, right, right. It was, I mean, these guys have pants on the ground. We got these kids are not there. They got their all this stuff. And, I, and now we got I Love Bikinis. Is that what we're about? We're Bikinis Church. We got I Love Bikinis. I was in all this. And finally, and, and I said this to this person is I said, you know what? This guy doesn't know Jesus, but has been gifted with amazing skill. And he shows up and serves on a Sunday. All you do is call me on Monday and complain. Click. (laughs) Salty never found out about that conversation. But he came back again and again and again and again. And worship improved. You know what else? When we went to three services... He continued to play, and he would sit through every service on the front row. When the rest of the band would sit for one, and then they'd go get coffee for two and three, he sat in every one. He'd listen. He's listening. And musicians, a lot of them, they don't talk like me with their mouths. They talk with their hands. They talk with their skill, with their ability. And he didn't get any big, deep conversations. And I'll just end it with this by by saying, I almost miss the day he came to Christ. Because he was playing pretty regular, and we'd do... Communion, you know what I mean by communion? Some of you come from, we call it the mass or whatever, you know, where we do the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the cup. And it was my job at that time to serve the band. And we did it on the down low. Everybody's worshiping and, you know, they play like this. And, you know, I'd go to each one and they'd all take, take it. Whenever I came to Mike, he'd be playing something beautiful for us right underneath and he'd just go. And I respected that. I just moved on. He wasn't leading in worship. He was just playing in the band. There's the whole theology of that. We can fight about it later. But then one Sunday, almost missed it. I happened to look up at Mike because I got used to just walking by. He had his face was shining. He's just like. And he stopped, he took the bread, dipped it in the cup, and by faith became a child of God. Now, who gets the credit for that? Dudes that went to Taco Bell? Skeet shooters? Youth pastor that got lucky? Dude that, you know, was freaked out about I Love Bikinis ads? Dude who gave him a job? People that welcomed him? Who gets, who gets the glory for that? God gets the glory. So I'm going to ask you again, who gets the glory for that? God. And my buddy Mike becomes a child of God. You could be a domino. You could be a worker. Translation of that is just a day laborer. Somebody just suit up and show up and be intentional. In fact, we're going to close with this right now. In fact, I'm going to invite the band to come on up here. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to think of one person that you know that you care about, that's not in your family. Seriously, I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. I can still see eyeballs. Come on, man. I want you to think of one person that you care about, that you know that's not in your family, who is far from God. Far from God as you can imagine. Now, if any way, shape, or form this message has sparked anything in your heart, I want you to ask God right now, God, what would you have me do to be a domino in that person's life? What, could I, what do I have? Is it time? Is it, is it a shared interest? Is it something creative? Is it being intentional? Is it sharing my story? Is it asking if I can pray for them? Something else I haven't thought of. God, what's one thing I could do to be a domino in that person's life?
In Jesus' name, amen. So now watch this. I told you my challenge was that you would make a commitment, not just to be a domino in that person's life. And by the way, whatever, whatever you, whatever person's face popped into your head, that's from the Lord. I don't know you, I don't know that person. If no one popped into your head, you need to get more friends. You need to get out of the Christian ghetto for a minute and meet some lost people. That's a whole different sermon I don't have time for. But that thing that you were like, God, what could I do? The first thing, don't say, well, that's stupid, that's dumb. For some of you, it's like, I could ask that guy if he wants to go to the gym with me. That's a great thing. You can lift weights and drop weights for the glory of God. Yeah. (laughs) You can get after it in the weight room with Jesus. If it's the mall, praise the Lord. Don't let the enemy tell you that's stupid because it's not. Do you realize if every single person in this room were to be the domino in just one college student's life and just get them to encounter, you'd need a new building. You'd create a problem for this church and its leadership and their board. Praise God. You could do it. You're bigger than most churches in America. Look around you. The average church in America is less than 100 people. Every great movement of God has begun with students, but not if they don't show up as workers. And so I'll end with this. If if you want to be a domino, if you want to make a commitment, I'm... I'm going to be a domino. I don't even know what it looks like. I don't know how. I'm freaked out. This is scary. But I can do that. I can do tacos. I can do weight room. I can do tip. Leaving the results to God. If you are willing to be the answer to that prayer request, and you're going to make a commitment. I got people all over the United States. I'm not boasting. I'm boasting in the Lord. Who still carry these little dominoes in their pockets. I had a guy in in an airport run into a flight, turns around, he goes, hey. He goes, you're Domino guy. And I'm like, how do I know you? A youth event in Fort Wayne, sorry, gotta go. Still got it, seven years ago. You could be a Domino. It could change your life, but more importantly, it could change someone else's. If you're committed, I wanna be the answer to his prayer. Encounter teams got dominoes all the way up here. And as an act of obedience, yep, as a commitment, God, I'm going to be one. It starts now. While we're singing this next song, I'm going to invite you. Come up and take one. Keep it in the little, you know, pocket. No one knows what that's for. Right in there. <laughs> keep it in your, your ashtray in your car, you know. You know, just keep it whenever you see it. Lord, how do you want to use me today, this morning, this evening, this night? How do you want to use me as a domino? If that's you... If that's you and you want to do that, we invite you to come take one as a commitment. Thanks. God bless you.